Number 10, Justice. Also known as Vance Astrovic, he has latent mutant telekinesis powers that were activated when he encountered his future self, Major Victory of the Guardians of the Galaxy. The Major also traveled back in time and across realities to prevent himself from ever acquiring powers, but instead just activated them early and created an alternate timeline. Man, talk about being your own worst enemy. He accidentally killed his father and went to prison, and during this time, learned to respect the law, even helping the guards during an uprising. When he was released, he had a new outlook on life and named himself Justice, becoming a hero. He has been a member of the New Warriors and later the Avengers, discovering a new way to defeat Ultron and helping them defeat him. His main power is his telekinesis, although he was once a fighter in the UCWF, Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation, where he was known as Manglin John Mahoney. Hey guys, if you like these videos and you want to see more, be sure to take a second and hit that like button. Number 9, Black Knight. Dane Whitman is actually the third character to bear the Black Knight name, and he first appeared in The Avengers number 47 in 1967. Nephew to the original Black Knight, he inherited a mystical sword that carried a curse and fought to restore honor to the Black Knight name. He uses a winged horse named Aragorn as his mount and as an Avenger helped the team take on Kang the Conqueror. An excellent swordsman with magic senses, he has been a member of many other teams including the Heroes for Hire and the Ultra Force. He had a four issue miniseries in 1990 and was the main character of his own series that was cancelled after a short time. If Black Knight is an Avenger that you have heard of, then good news for you, he'll be appearing in the upcoming Marvel film Eternals in 2021, played by Kit Harington. If you've seen Game of Thrones, then I'm sure you'll agree he's a great choice. Can't wait to see Jon Snow in the MCU. Number 8, Two Gun Kid. In 1948, Marvel released their first ever Western comic book, Two Gun Kid. An expert gunslinger, wrongly accused of murder, he spends his life on the run, but does good everywhere he goes. Just him, his two six guns, and his trusty guitar. Marvel had great success with this and went on to create a whole slew of western themed comics, but I'll bet the kid never thought he would one day be riding alongside men in tights as a member of the Avengers. The kid met the Avengers when they went up against the time traveling villain Kang in 1870 and got along really well with Hawkeye, so he just joins up and helps them take on Kang. Afterwards, he returns to the 20th century with the Avengers. In the modern era, he works alongside She-Hulk, hoping to become her colleague since she works at a law firm, but quickly realizes he'll never be able to catch up on all the new laws and instead becomes a bounty hunter. He rides around in an awesome jet cycle named Lightning, which he uses to fly around the city. Number 7, Hellcat. Real name Patricia Walker. You might recognize her from Marvel's Netflix shows where she is guest starred, but did you know she was also once an Avenger? Hellcat joined up with the Avengers in 1976, but actually had her own teen romantic comedy series before this called Miss America Magazine in 1944. Similar to Two Gun Kid, this is a popular character that sort of slowly evolved into a superhero. She appears again in 1977 in The Defenders, where she meets the son of Satan, and the two later become married, a husband and wife occult investigation team. She is a well-trained martial artist and gymnast, with wrist-mounted claws and grappling hooks. Surprisingly, she has appeared in five different Marvel video games, including LEGO Avengers. Number 6, Moon Dragon. Heather Douglas was a young girl driving through the desert with her parents when Thanos' spaceship landed on Earth. Not wanting witnesses, he blew up their car, but Heather was thrown from the vehicle and survived. Her father's corpse is later reanimated to create Drax the Destroyer. Thanos' father, Mentor, found her and took her to his homeworld Titan, where she studied the Titan's ways and unlocked her latent psychic potential. However, she becomes influenced by the Dragon of the Moon, and believing she has success resisted its influence, takes on the name Moon Dragon. She was present when the Avengers confronted Korvac, using her powers to see into his mind while they fought. She later joins the Defenders alongside Valkyrie and discovers she's still being influenced by the Dragon of the Moon. She manages to resist it for real this time, but as they are separated she begins to die from mutated spores and the Dragon appears again, offering to save her life if she agrees to be its host. She does agree, and then as an evil dragon dragon fights against the defenders until the four of them sacrifice themselves to kill both her and the dragon. Number 5, Tigra. Greer Nelson was a costumed vigilante named Cat 
who was enhanced by a doctor who gave her cat-like powers tied to her costume. She is later mutated into Tigra, a human-tiger hybrid created through a mystical ritual. Her feline physiology grants her a number of superhuman capabilities. In addition to the usual super strength and stuff, she has superhuman senses and a regenerative healing factor. Her teeth and claws are razor sharp and capable of cutting through bone, stone, and even some metals. She wears a cat's head amulet as a talisman for her so she can change back and forth between her feline form. She became a part of the Avengers in issue number 211 and proved herself in battle against the Molecule Man. She eventually moves to San Francisco and becomes friends with Spider-Woman. She also helped out at Avengers Academy after the fall of Norman Osborn. Number four. Falcon. Also known as Samuel Wilson, Falcon grew up in a tough Harlem neighborhood and his father was killed trying to stop a fight. His mother later died protecting her children from a mugging and Sam eventually gets involved with the mob at one point, seeming like he would never become a hero. Red Skull uses the cosmic cube to give Sam the ability to telepathically speak with birds, especially a falcon that Wilson names Red Wing. He is sent to take on Captain America but Cap frees Wilson from Red Skull's control and as Falcon, he becomes Cap's partner and the two work together for a long time. Black Panther also helps out Falcon by helping to create his harness that allows him to fly. He joins the Avengers between issue 184 and 194 but finds out that he's just been drafted to fill a quota and resentful of being a token, he quits as soon as he can. Number three, Firebird. First appearing in Incredible Hulk number 265 in 1981, Bonita Juarez was walking across the desert of New Mexico when a huge ball of fire crashed down into the sand just 10 feet from where she stood. Bathed in extraterrestrial radiation, she later discovers she received fire-based superpowers. She believed the fireball was a manifestation of the American Indian legend of the Firebird and so makes herself a costume and decides to become a hero with the name Firebird. She helped out the West Coast Avengers in a battle against Master Pandemonium and later was recruited onto the Avengers during a spiritual journey during which she was going by the name La Espirita. She discovers that her powers were actually from an alien child's failed experiment and not an act of God and after a brief crisis of faith returns to the name Firebird. Her and the Rangers worked alongside Kane in Scarlet Spider Volume 2 helping him to battle against a monster made of pure energy. Number 2 Stingray Walter Newell was an oceanographer and engineer supervising the construction of an underwater city. He designed a unique suit for deep sea exploration, basing the design on manta rays and taking up the name Stingray. He was ordered to investigate Namor, but believed him to be innocent and later allows him to escape. In Avengers Volume 3, he was one of the many heroes who responded to the rallying call but chose not to remain an Avenger full time. He later becomes a fully active member of the Avengers when Kang the Conqueror begins to strike all around the Earth. He helped to enlist the help of the Atlanteans in the fight on the waterfront and was a great asset thanks to his nautical experience. He ultimately leaves the Avengers, but remains a reserve member and still responds to emergency calls. Number one, Demolition Man. Similar to Justice, D-Man was also once a wrestler in the Unlimited Class Wrestling Federation. Born Dennis Dunphy, he was raised in Detroit and idolized superheroes as a boy. A college football player, hoping to one day be drafted, he accepts an offer from the power broker, hoping he'll get the power he needs to become a professional football player. Unfortunately, he winds up too powerful to safely compete with normal athletes, so the power broker sets him up as a wrestler. After Captain America takes an interest in the power broker, Dennis allies with him. Later, he joins the Avengers informally. He designed and built his own costume based on Wolverine and Daredevil suits, and he nearly dies in a plane crash, joins the US Army, and at one point joins Wonder Man's Revengers, dedicated to dismantling the Avengers. He even becomes bonded with a symbiote at one point, and is later turned into a vampire to save his life after he becomes mortally wounded. Number 10, Bob. Hands down the best name for a superhero sidekick, period, we have Bob. Making his first appearance in Cable and Deadpool issue 38, Bob is a former member of the terrorist agency known as Hydra. Hail Hydra. But most importantly, hail Bob. So how did Bob get into Hydra in the first place? What are you doing, Bob? Well, his wife Allison was giving him a hard time for not being able to get a steady job. 
so he figured he would work for Hydra. Classic. He wasn't a big fan of the organization though, only because they didn't have dental coverage. I mean, fair. Not a bad point, Bob. Valid point. Funny enough, Bob made a brief cameo in the 2016 Deadpool movie, where in the final battle of the film, he caught up with him, talking about Bob's wife, Gail, and her amazing tuna casserole, right before a quick headbutt knockout. But don't worry, Wade dragged Bob off screen to safety, or so we assume. Number nine, Elsa Bloodstone. I can already hear the fans of Elsa Bloodstone raging in an uproar of that they know Elsa and how dare I put her on this list. And while yes, Elsa Bloodstone does have some very passionate fans, I will add that there are actually a lot of Marvel fans out there who are unfamiliar with her. Trust me, I know some pretty intense fellow comic nerds who have never heard of her until running into her in Marvel Strike Force. I'm looking at you, Dylan. So I thought it might be nice to talk a little bit more about this character who is super awesome, but tends to be less celebrated and not as well known to most. Elsa was born into a legacy of monster hunters. Her father Ulysses was a monster hunter before her, and so it was her destiny to defeat monsters while working alongside the good ones. Let's not forget that the Marvelverse also has a whole other horror and monster aspect to it as well. After all, Blade is also a part of Marvel. Have we ever gotten a Blade and Elsa team up, by the way? That is something I'd love to see. Should have already happened at this point. Number eight, Jasper Sitwell. He made his comic book debut in 1966 in Strange Tales, issue 144, and his cinematic debut in Thor 1. We all remember that agent Natasha Romanoff kicked off the building in Captain America Winter Soldier. That was the big reveal moment for the Falcon. But who was the agent that they were threatening? Well, Jasper Sitwell posed as a high-ranking S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. In reality, he was actually working for Hydra. This dude wasn't close, too. Like, him and Coulson were the ones that got the call about Thor's hammer first landing on Earth. And he was one of the secret masterminds behind Project Insight. Could have been worse, though. In the comics, Sitwell is actually Nick Fury's assistant, and at one point, Tempest rarely becomes the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Sitwell is played by Maximiliano Hernandez in the MCU, so if you want to see him on the big screen, we've got a little bit of catching up to do. Number 7, Lindsay McCabe. Lindsay is the best friend of Jessica Drew. You maybe never knew that she had? Me, personally, I thought Jessica's best friend might be Carol Danvers, and maybe now that might be more true, but throughout the later 70s to the mid-90s in the comics, Lindsay McCabe was it. She and Jessica met while living in New York at a group therapy clinic. Jessica liked Lindsay because she was a tough, strong woman who wasn't afraid of Jessica or intimidated by Jessica's strange powers. Eventually, the two moved to San Francisco together when Lindsay got the opportunity to study theater there. Lindsay herself was an actress. Lindsay would eventually learn Jessica was Spider-Woman and would also spend some time working with Jess when she had her private investigation agency. She would also try to help Wolverine in the disguise of Patch, whom she also knew previously, though did not actually recognize. She didn't know it was Wolverine, thought it was Patch. To save her friend Jessica when she was possessed by the Black Blade, aka the Muramasa Blade. Number six. Space Knights. Okay, these guys are awesome, and I hope we get a Space Knights show soon, or in my lifetime at least. They're fairly new to the game, having first appeared in Guardians of Infinity issue 2, only back in 2016. So a long time ago in the Outer Rim, a substance known as Core was discovered. This substance gave a little bit of flair to the Perrin's warriors' weapons. So led by Horn, the warriors saved the planet from slavery. One thing to note about Core that's rather important is that if it's sitting too long, it would corrupt the soldiers, so they always have to get a move on. Kind of like if I'm near chocolate milk at any point in my life. It's just eventually going to corrupt me and then I'm going to have to chug all of it because I have no self-control as a human being. Get it away from me. Go. Gone. So as time went on, more and more joined in on the Warriors' efforts and the group came to be known as, you guessed it, the Space Knights. Number 5, Peepers. Peepers is one of those much lesser known mutants who has been around for quite a long time, but due to his unimpressive power set, pops up a lot less in comparison to others. Similar to iBoy, Peepers' powers all kind of have to do pretty much with his sight or his eyes. A physical mutation made his eyes larger than most, so much so that they kind of protrude outward to an extent. He has enhanced eyesight, x-ray vision, and was sometimes even known to be able to fire optic blasts out of his eyes. Similar to Cyclops, but not really on the same level as the X-Men team leader. Peeper's legal name is Peter Quinn, and while I haven't seen him pop up yet in the Dawn of X line, and hey, I've been watching for that, he has made a recent appearance in Marvel's Ravencroft series, where he appears to be working as an orderly or a medical assistant at Ravencroft. 
pretty random. Number four, Ella Whitby. Making her comic book debut back in Deadpool Volume 2, Issue 40, Ella Whitby was the doctor who helped Deadpool escape Crossmore Institution in England. But it wasn't long before she confessed her love for the Merc of the Mouth. Wade, however, didn't share the same feelings. Ella started to become a bit of a stalker, I guess you could say. She confessed her love to him again, only this time not so fashionable, with a homemade Deadpool suit attached to her body. So Deadpool starts to get curious and goes to her house, Turns out she's collected body parts of Deadpool. So Deadpool realizes that she's probably going for the warden next to make Deadpool happy and all. So he goes to warden's house and just as he had expected, she was waiting there to kill the warden in just the way Deadpool would do it himself. That is by boiling tea made with ammonium nitrate on the stove with a plastic bag in the oven filling with gas. So after the explosion, Wade went back to her apartment, met up with a very burned Ella and told her that he loves somebody else. Hashtag Wade the heartbreaker. Number three, amazing baby. You might not know Amazing Baby just yet because, well, they're a super new character. But they also exist as a throwback to an older X-Men enemy, the War Wolves. War Wolves were an enemy of the X-Men that were almost shapeshifters. Almost. Their ability allowed them to drain their enemies of their life energy and then basically wear their skins like a suit, disguising themselves as that person. These War Wolves originally hailed from Mojo World and were sentient, wolf-like, metallic-looking creatures. Amazing Baby is a War Wolf pup that the Excalibur team in the Dawn of X line rescued from Cullen Bloodstone. Yes, relation to Elsa, who we talked about earlier. Cullen's her brother. The rescue pup was then given to Rachel Summers, who agreed to look after the little one, despite how dangerous the mutants know this pup could grow up to be. She named her pet Warwolf Amazing Baby. And you can also see him pop up in the Dawn of X's X Factor series alongside Rachel. And number two, Macho Gomez. Making his debut in Deadpool Volume 2, Issue 32, Macho Gomez is said to be the baddest, most feared operator in the galaxy. And his name sure does sound like it. He's a skilled fighter when it comes to shooting. He's got six fingers on each hand instead of five, so he has that extra accuracy, you know? He's got that one little flip flop over for stability. He's kind of like a Mandalorian bounty hunter in a way. He has the cockiness and the attitude to follow suit as well. When he was hired to assassinate the family of Reginald Harris, he was actually tricked into thinking Deadpool had already done the job before him. So naturally, he was kind of pissed and wanted to get back at him. Now, fighting Deadpool is usually a pretty tough task. So Macho Gomez lost a battle more than once. And after losing a battle to Deadpool, Macho was pushed into an escape pod and sent into the depths of space. Meanwhile, Wade took his place and replaced him at Funzel, even marrying Orksa. That's Deadpool for you, I don't know. Number one, Kandra. I love how when Kandra first appeared in the comics, she already came with a ton of backstory and power. The funny part was that although she threw her weight around as this supervillain of sorts in Gambit issue number one, and was this immortal who had ties to tons of other characters, this was our first time meeting her. What an introduction. During her initial appearance, Kandra was revealed to be the Benefactress, a character who had pitted the Thieves Guild and Assassin's Guild of New Orleans against one another for centuries for her own purposes. She is also heavily implied to be a former lover of Gambits, and we'd come to know her as a member of the often now forgotten Externals, an immortal, often villainous group of mutants who are insanely powerful, and not to be confused with the Eternals, which is a totally different group. And Externals as well cannot die. Well, for the most part. Remember Celine? She was also a part of the externals, but Celine simply became much more popular, so we still know who she is. Coming in at number 10, Prowler. Hobby Brown. Now, when I mention the Prowler, of course, the first thing that comes to your mind is Aaron Davis, the uncle of Miles Morales, who played one of the villains in Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. If you haven't seen it, it literally won an Oscar. It's amazing. Go watch it right now after this video. That is one of the best movies, period. Not just animated movies, but best movies ever. Yeah, that's it. But I'm talking about Hobby Brown's Prowler. A little bit different. He made his comic book debut back in Amazing Spider-Man 78 in 1969. I like the OG Prowler more. He was a villain and then kind of like a hero. And he has an honest character arc, you know? Like, he was this guy who cleaned windows for a living. In the middle of a shift, this guy gets caught in the middle of a fight with Daredevil and Stiltman. So after that incident, he was inspired to make his own suit and secret identity to go along with it. So he made himself wrist and ankle bracelets to hold cleaning fluid and gave himself boots and claws to help climb. Not a bad idea at all. Kind of feels like you just want to be a villain. I don't know. That's a really weird way of doing it. Get a camel back. Put it in there. Then spray the stuff. I don't know. It's an idea. So after he lost his job, however, it became clear what his next step had to be. Now I say had to because this was an honest guy who didn't want to hurt anybody. He didn't want to be a villain. He just needed to get by. 
Spider-Man gave him warnings too, like he didn't really crack down on him too hard. He knew that Hobby Brown wasn't a bad guy, and that's what I love about him. We have Aaron Davis in the MCU, played by Childish Gambino, and he's an arms dealer, so I'm hoping, hoping, as you guys are probably as well, that he makes a similar character arc becoming the Prowler, whilst also introducing Miles Morales in that MCU. And I feel like we're honestly days away from finding out who's playing Miles in the MCU because they're filming, I think right now, the new Spider-Man. So comment down below who you think is going to be casted and then once it's out, we can come back and check the comments and see who's right and who's wrong. And we'll shout out only the wrong people. We'll shame you. Shame. He also looks a lot like Spawn. I don't know, just saying. Number nine, the orb. This guy is quite fun, and believe it or not, he's been clearly referenced in the MCU. You just gotta keep an eye out for it. Puns, here we go. There's so many puns in this thing, by the way. It's gonna get nuts. These puns are wild. Yeah, he's got an eyeball for a head, and no, I'm not joking. Making his first appearance in Ghost Rider Volume 6, Issue 26, the orb is, well, yeah, look at him. He was born with a head that was a giant eye, and if that's not already the coolest thing ever, I don't really know what it is. His parents abandoned him at a young age because, well of course they did, I mean, it would be quite the scene during childbirth. Oh, it's crowning, yep, I think I see, I think I see the head, nope, it sees me. It's, it's definitely a big eyeball, that's, we gotta go. So naturally he was made fun of, he couldn't speak either, I mean he just made squishy noises. His massive eyeball head had powers, I mean I hope, or else this guy's life is just a horror film. He can blast people with this red energy beam that shoots out of his eye face, eye thing. And he can even tell when somebody's thinking about him, which would probably be a lot of the time considering that's what he looks like. So yeah, he was for sure referenced in Ant-Man and the Wasp, right at the start of the movie when Scott is playing with Cassie, she has to use this retinal scanner thing, it's like in the cardboard fort, and she puts on this paper plate mask that looks like a big eye. And if that's not a reference to the orb, it's a reference to Mike Wachowski, so one or the other, I got it. Number eight, Jack-o-lantern. Tis the season, so it's only fair to include Jack-o-lantern. Making his debut in Captain America issue 396, he's a sick villain. Jason McIndale, who started off as a mercenary but was deemed too violent, so naturally after his departure he donned a new look and gave himself a fancy new evil nickname to go along with it, Jack-o-lantern. I love his look, it's very headless horseman type, I like it. He was referred to as Mad Jack in Spectacular Spider-Man in the 90s, and he actually was Mysterio. This whole time? No, no, just in that iteration. So from 1996 and onwards, starting with Spectacular Spider-Man 241, that's when Norman Osborn comes up to Daniel Beckert and pitches his new alter ego, Mad Jack. He shows him the new pumpkin head, very nice touch, elegant, nice and terrifying too. The fancy glider, the pumpkin bombs, the blasters. I can see a live action jack-o'-lantern happening, for real. I mean, we're pretty much there with all the gliders and the gear. Once you throw on a jack-o'-lantern into the picture, it's, that's it, it's pretty much done. We have Hobgoblin, we have all those gliders. I think it's time for Jack-O-Lantern, hashtag Mad Jack. Number seven, Jim Jaspers. He made his debut in Daredevils number seven in 1983. This dude's pretty wild. He started off as a British politician who served as the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, and then he was a leader of the Conservative Party, okay? So he was known for his anti-superhero stance. I mean, of course, your name is Jim Jaspers. You already sound like an annoying character, brother. Jim Jaspers, mm -hmm. Jim Jaspers over here, sir. He didn't like soups because he wanted to keep Britain safe. Fair, I mean, you got a point. So of course, many people agreed with him and he won the general election. Bam, done, done. But Jim Jaspers had some little Jim Jaspers tricks up his sleeves. He actually was a mutant with reality warping powers. Oh shit. these type of guys scare me. Like one bad day and then it's over. Like, they're crazy, I don't like those guys. So he's representing Haslam West and even gets knighted by Queen Elizabeth. So he creates this strike team whose job it is to gather up all the superheroes and the slogan and all the posters says, in your hearts, you know he's right. In our hearts, way to go after our souls. The best part of the capabilities of Jim Jaspers takes place in the Marvel UK storyline, Crooked World. So if you wanna see the reality warping Jim Jaspers is capable of in full force, you gotta check that out yourselves. Also, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Jim Jaspers will be introduced in WandaVision and will be a secret villain working quietly. I'm calling it now. Check the date, that's it. Number six, Hyperion. The Superman of the Marvel Universe, basically. I mean, making his first appearance in Avengers issue 69 back in 1969, nice. That's right, so when the Grandmaster traveled to Earth 712, he challenged Scarlet Supreme to a contest. So each fighter gets to kind of pick their own team. 
So the Grandmaster won using the Squadron Supreme. So he changed three people over to become Nighthawk, Dr. Spectrum, and the Wizard. Now of course, he still needed that Hyperion spot, so he created him out of extra dimensional matter. Speared fingers. Even throwing in the artificial memories to go along with it. He was made to think he was Zibron, the space explorer from Yttrium, a planet from one of the microverses. Named after the titan of Greek mythology, Hyperion actually went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Thor. Thor! But, you know, with Thor being Thor and all, Hyperion ended up losing. The hammer was too much to handle. Another pun. Kind of. That was, yeah, we're pushing. Hyperion was shrunk, depowered, and imprisoned by Thor into this tiny glass globe. Don't worry though, Nebulon got him out. He's good. Number five, Lyra. We go now to Earth 8009, beginning with Hulk Raging Thunder issue one. We find Lyra Walters, or more commonly referred to as Savage She-Hulk. So she's from Earth 8009 in the 23rd century, and then at that time, the Earth was split into two different factions. The guys' factions were like warriors, you know? They just looked up to heroes like Wolverine, just menly men, I guess, being men. And the women came together under the United Sisterhood Republic, and they were outgunned and outmanned. Literally. So Thundra got sent to Earth 616 where she met that Earth's Hulk and then had a baby. And then Lyra actually gets stronger when she's calm, which is of course not common when it comes to our green giants. That'd be amazing to see though. It just cuts to like Lyra reading a book and everyone's like, man, she's wild right now. Look at how strong she is. She's like, just jacked while she's reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Green. This is great, this is awesome. She's also able to tap into gamma sight, which means she basically can see the flow of gamma radiation. She's one with the gamma. Like all over the world too, not like within her personal range. She has like, she taps into all of it. So she becomes more skilled in this state because she sees everything and knows the next move. If she becomes angry, however, she will actually become weaker. So it's a fun little game of opposites. But at her weakest, she's still strong as Spider-Man, so. Doesn't quite say a lot when you say the word weakness. Number four, Songbird. Also known as Melissa Gold, Songbird made her comic debut in 1997 in The Incredible Hulk issue 449. She ran away from her parents at a young age, of course, and whilst developing a hard knock life attitude, she ended up becoming a professional wrestler, just like the Spider Gwen version of She-Hulk, funny enough. That would be a fun crossover, I don't know. She gave herself the stage name Screaming Mimi and joined the wrestling crew, the Grapplers. Now, in Marvel's television run, they could for sure bring this character in, it can happen, and it would be a blast. So the Grapplers were straight killing it, but they weren't making the same amount of money as the male wrestlers. That rings a familiar bell, huh, doesn't it? So they took on a new job with the Roxxon Oil Company. Now, of course, the mission failed because Quasar came in and had to save the day. Melissa was given vocal cord implants that provided her with acoustic kinetics. Hence the name Screaming Mimi. You figured it out. She can make all these crazy weapons with just her voice and even has the ability to craft herself wings and fly. Whenever I scream, my voice just cracks. Like, a lot. Number three, Swarm. Okay, this next guy is an absolute unit. Fritz von Meyer made his debut in Champions issue 14 back in 1977. And as you can probably guess by his name, he's made of a thousand bees. And as you can probably guess by his actual name, he's also a Nazi scientist. He used looted gold to pay for all of his projects. He's his Nazi beekeeper. I mean, what a character. One day he found a beehive that was quite different to say the least. So Fritz made a device that would help reawaken these mysterious bees, which he thought were the end result of a mutation with a nearby fallen meteorite. So these bees ended up attacking and killing Fritz. Not the Nazi beekeeper Fritz! As you would think, his consciousness was spread out through all of these bees, and now you have this monstrosity bee guy. Just a man made of bees. I don't care what criminal you are, if you see a guy made out of bees, I'm tapping out, that's it. Like, there's no fight. If I was robbing a bank and I heard like behind me, there's no chance any amount of honey, I mean money, is worth that pain. Puns are killing it. Number two, Leapfrog. Yep, you heard me. Okay, picture this. What if when Cap said Avengers Assemble and Avengers Endgame and it just panned through all those characters, there was just like a frog just chilling there, like a frog guy just standing like, yeah, let's mess him up. All wet and frog-like. Vincent Patilio, of course, was an inventor. I mean, who else gets to this point in their life? Must be a wacky inventor. Making his first comic book debut in Daredevil issue 25 in 1967, he was a loser. In his own words, he said this, not me. 
He invented things, but nothing was sticking. Again with the puns, oh my god, this guy's wild. So until one day, he created these powerful leaping coils. And after that, he decided to, well, do crimes, because of course. And in one of his first villainous outings, he went to an airport and started leaping around and prevented planes from taking off. That's the worst villain move right there. Delaying my trip to Fiji? Mm-mm, no sir, leapy man. This guy would be a great villain for a TV show. I feel like Falcon and the Winter Soldier could bring him in for like one episode. They have Patrock the Leaper coming back, so let's just do like a team of leapers. The entire episode is just Sebastian Stan looking around like, And lastly, coming in at number one, Gamecock. Yep, I said that. Carlos Cabrera made his comic book debut in Captain America issue 183. He was a small villain who crossed paths with Steve Rogers a couple of times. And as far as powers go, he has none. But he dresses like this, so one would only assume he's the coolest, strongest, baddest dude in the game. He is, however, a great fighter. And I see how the inspiration came about. Cockfighting, the sharp claws, he's a great fighter. He also sports the claws on his feet and his hands. And if you think this guy wasn't already insane enough, he has a crew that he rolls with who also dresses up like chickens. I feel like they could use this character in an Easter egg easily. I mean, just having any sporting event with a chicken mascot and his name could be Carlos. Boom, then all of us would be like, that's the chicken thug, I know that guy. Maybe he could even call his gang the chicken nuggets. And whenever he wants to leave, he like snaps his fingers and he goes, let's dip. And the other chicken dudes are like, yeah, let's go rob somebody. I could use an extra buck. Yeah, that's like seven of puns. I'll leave now, that's fair, that's fair. Number 10, Karma. Karma is a mutant with very specific powers, so it should surprise no one that she is part of the New Mutants team. I actually love the New Mutants for this reason. A lot of their members tend to be forgotten and yet are super powerful when their abilities are properly utilized. Xi'an Koiman possesses limited telepathic abilities, but can have a strong sense of sort of psychic projection. Karma can emit a wave of energy that disables her target's consciousness, allowing her to take over control of their body. Body, experiencing what they experience as though she were actually in their body, sensing what they taste, hear, smell, see, and feel. Those she controls will awaken unaware, afterwards experiencing this possession as if they had just been in a dream and basically had been sleepwalking. She can also do this on a mass scale, possessing multiple people, though she must overcome many challenges in order to fluidly control multiple people at once. Number 9, Hijack. Hijack is David Bond, a technopath mutant who can use his abilities to telepathically control any vehicle. He has used his powers to control massive sentinels and even control an entire helicarrier. The rule seems to be if you can steer it, fly it, or drive it, Hijack can control it. Although it has been implied that the vehicle in question likely needs to have some kind of mechanical makeup. So, sailboats are probably not something Bond could manipulate. Unless you had a sailboat that also had an engine, which I think is a thing now. <laughs> I don't think all sailboats are just sails. Still, in a world where we are surrounded by tech and tons of engine powered vehicles, David Bond's abilities are pretty powerful. Alas, he has only appeared in less than 50 issues of comics. Someone tell me, where is David Bond now? Where is he on Krakoa? Is he there? I wanna see him. Number 8, Summoner. Summoner is a new mutant whose name also signifies the type of mutant that they are. They are the child of Apocalypse's first horseman of war. Arako, the landmass itself, was drawn to Krakoa and Krakoa to it. The two fused together to increase the size of the land overall, although Arako is not yet considered safe and is basically known as kind of the monster territory part of Krakoa. I mean, technically it still isn't Krakoa, but they're attached now, so they are each other. Summoner's abilities allow them to summon the dark beasts of Arako. We don't know too much about them yet because they've only been in a few issues, but what we do know is that they can withstand the blast of one of Cable's thermal grenades, his last one in fact, without taking virtually any damage. So overall, they seem like they're going to be pretty crazy and powerful. X of Swords, I'm assuming we're going to see more about them. Number 7. Dust. Dust is Soraya Kadir. She was enslaved as a child but freed by the X-Men. Originally, she did not want to reveal herself to the mutants and hid herself by turning into scattered sand. When Jean Grey sensed her presence and encouraged Soraya to reveal and introduce herself, she did so by referring to herself as to Rob, which is Arabic for dust. She can turn herself into dust and manipulate her body to move at high speeds, causing her to become a deadly sandstorm to her enemies. As sand particles, she can also enter the bodies of other people, causing 
causing internal damage. Dust is also resistant to magic and telepathic manipulation or detection while in her sand form. Dust is another person that I feel like we never see enough of in the comics. Someone bring back Dust. Number 6, Layla Miller. Layla's abilities, skills, and powers tend to be pretty specific, which means that she might not inherently seem powerful to readers. Layla has been shown to be able to reanimate beings, heal wounds, and appears to be immune to reality warping. She also has a lot of knowledge about her own future life and the events surrounding it as she spent time in the future and then returned and uploaded all she had learned into her younger self when she returned to that Layla's present, which I guess was technically her past. Her vast knowledge often comes in handy and is what helped the mutants to figure out who was really after the baby mutant Messiah during the events of Messiah Complex. Her own knowledge has also technically helped her in gaining the knowledge that she is needed to have in order to gain it, if that makes any sense. Timey wimey stuff. Number 5, Maxime and Manon. Maxime and Manon are twin siblings born to mutant parents. Their powers as such manifested when they were younger than most. They haven't been in a ton of comics, most about probably 11 issues, but they have been shown to be pretty deadly and powerful even as children, both in Extermination and recently in the newest run of New Mutants. Maxime can influence others emotions while Manon can alter someone's memories or recall their memories past. When combined, their powers actually allow them to manipulate the minds of others to the point that they can easily control them, shaping their victims into whatever they like them to be and making them do whatever they want. In issues 3 and 4 of New Mutants, both Maxime and Manon were captured along with Armor, Glob, Angel Salvador, Beak, and the couple's children, but managed to escape. Manon and Maxime helped to free the rest of the group by distracting their captives, manipulating one of them into killing the other. Number 4, Mirage. You might not recognize her mutant name, but if you've seen the New Mutants film or you are familiar with the New Mutants at all, Mirage will be someone that you maybe know. Mirage is actually Daniel Moonstar. Standard X-Men fans may be less familiar with Danny, but she has also been one of the X-Men and she is known for her affiliation with the New Mutants crew and all the female defenders who are also known as Valkyroar. Danny herself became a Valkyrie when the New Mutants were kidnapped by Amora the Enchantress and taken Asgard. So she doesn't just have her mutant power of illusion creation and telepathy, which originally she could only use to recreate the fear of others, but she also has some of the powers granted to Valkyries. Oh, and she can make cool psionic arrows too. Number 3, Strong Guy. Strong Guy has similar powers to another mutant we talked about on part 1 of this list. His abilities allow him to use kinetic energy to augment his strength, increasing it. However, he cannot hold the energy for long as it could severely harm him, distort his physical form, or even kill him. Still, even with the rule that he must expel any absorbed energy within less than 2 minutes of absorption, he is pretty powerful, using his powers to safely lift up to around 100 tons. Strong Guy's real name is Guido Carousella, and he first appeared appeared in the original New Mutant series in issue 29. Number 2, a mutant with no name. In the alternate reality belonging to the Ultimate Universe of 1610, we got a story that introduced us to a mutant who had no name. This mutant's powers were so devastating that we were not permitted the time to get to know him. His powers had only just manifested, but they were so deadly that they caused the deaths of over 200 people in his hometown, including his parents and his girlfriend at high school, with the deaths being almost instantaneous. But there was no snapping involved. It wasn't a Thanos thing. No Infinity Gone. His mutant power was basically to kill everything around him, radiating toxins and poisons that basically vaporize organic tissue. He was so dangerous, powerful, and deadly that Wolverine was sent to eliminate him as the young mutant's existence posed too much of a threat to the mutant image, as well as both humans and mutants alike, just in general. Number 1, Matthew Malloy. Matthew Malloy is one of the strongest, most random mutants who now belongs to the alternate timeline of Earth 14923 because he was just too powerful to basically continue to exist. Like many of the most epic mutants, he had reality warping powers and was additionally considered omega level in terms of his ability. Matthew's powers unfortunately were often tied to his emotions, which proved problematic and often resulted in massively destructive outbursts of energy. In the end, Tempest traveled back in time and with help from Professor X of the past, was able to prevent Matthew's parents from ever meeting. 
meaning that he was never born. Number 10, Deadly Genesis. We can talk about different X-Men and mutant teams here, but I'd also like to touch on some of the rosters as well that you may have forgotten about. This one might be due to selective memory loss, or it could just be because you haven't read the story yet. We are talking here about the X-Men Deadly Genesis limited series, which revealed the next team sent into Krakoa after the X-Men team we know went missing. This team wasn't necessarily a bad one at all. In fact, all of these mutants are kind of super powerful, but they were all basically introduced in this short series, which didn't really help to make us care as much about them as we could have. All in all, this story just had a very early 2000s feel to it. Not that that's a bad thing. The Deadly Genesis X-Men team were a group of kids that Moira McTaggart was trying to help out. She didn't even really see them as students, and then Charles recruited them and turned them into X-Men. The team consisted of Sway, Petra, Vulcan, and Darwin, who have all recently reappeared in the Dawn of X line. Line, in case you were wondering where they made their first appearance. Number 9, Xavier Security Enforcers. One that we might forget about every now and then is the mutant team that Bishop originally belonged to from the alternate dystopian future that he hails from. I believe this Earth is 1191, but I could be mistaken on that. Didn't even write down my Earth number bothers me. This mutant team is known as the XSE, which stands for Xavier Security Enforcers. If you know Bishop well and you're a big fan, you likely know this team well. But for those who are new to the character, you might not know about this group of enforcers. The point of the team that Bishop was part of was to preserve the long dead Professor Charles Xavier's dream, where mutants and humans could exist in harmony, living peacefully together. Bishop has even been known to wield specific future equipment, which he got from XSE, although we haven't seen them in a while. All members of the team wear their mutant tattoo brands like a badge of honor, and the members have included Randall, Malcolm, and Bishop's sister Shard, among others over the years. Before we hop into our number 8 spot, I just want to thank all of you for being here and give you a quick reminder to click that like if you are enjoying this video. It really does help us out. Number 8, Nasty Boys. You might remember the original villainous Marauders team, but do you remember Mr. Sinister's Nasty Boys? Don't worry if you have, because I will never let you forget. Well, both the Marauders and Nasty Boys teams are villainous teams, I couldn't have an obscure mutant team list and not seize the opportunity to remind you all of the Nasty Boys. So here we are. I also just love this name for the team. I personally always read Mr. Sinister with like the most outlandish, flamboyant, yet manipulative pseudo English accent. So for me, it's very fitting that he decided to name his team this. Nasty Boys, so perfect. It fits perfectly with the voice that I have for him in my mind. The Nasty Boys were the team that came after the Marauders. Instead of Gambit being involved in the team, Multiple Man was the generally heroic mutant who got involved. Originally, the team saw Ruckus as leader, with Slab, Gorgeous George, Ramrod, and Hairbag making up the roster. Gorgeous George even resurfaced in Dawn of X more recently. Yay! I might be the only one, but I'm still kind of hoping that the Nasty Boys as well will make a return. Bring them back. Bring them back. Number seven, Outback. When it comes to X-Men rosters as teams, one of the best but shortest running roster is the Outback team. This era for the X-Men team lasted less than 25 issues, but was still so good that people still talk about it today. Now, if you missed this one and you've never heard of it, it's one that you actually probably should read. Not one of my silly points, more one of my serious and beloved forgotten teams on this list. The team started off in issue 229 of Uncanny X-Men, with Storm, Wolverine, Rogue, Colossus, Dazzle, Longshot, Havoc, and Psylocke on it. We'd also see Jubilee introduced during this roster's time together. The Outback team is noted as being one of the best rosters for the X-Men when it comes to having a group who truly feel like outsiders. Also, you get to enjoy the Inferno story in this run, which is bizarre and magical. So you're welcome for that. Number six, X-Corps. No, I'm not talking about the X-Corporation, which has yet to come out, but is still coming our way. Thank goodness. I thought that book was going to be firmly cancelled, but fortunately it has been revived. I'm so ready for X-Corporation, let's go. When we talk about x Corps, we are talking about Banshee's team. He formed this team after Generation X disbanded and most of the team were composed of that era of mutants. This team was made up of former villains turned heroes and was created to act as a police force basically for the mutant community. Joining Banshee were The Blob, Avalanche, Fever Pitch, Jubilee, Husk, 
and M, aka Monet. The X-Men team actually did not approve of this team's creation and actually attempted to get Banshee to disband it. In the end, Mystique infiltrated the team and liberated its members, especially the villains, who were being manipulated into behaving heroically by Mastermind under Banshee's orders. Number 5. Extreme X-Men This X-Men roster marked the return of Chris Claremont to the X-Men in a full-time capacity. Extreme X-Men Volume 1 is a series that started in 2001 and ran till 2004. It was a team that featured my girl Rogue as the leader, woohoo, which you know I'm all about. The original Extreme X Men roster also featured Beast, Psylocke, Bishop, Storm, Sage, and Thunderbird on the team. Lifeguard, Gambit, and Slipstream were also added to the mix throughout. This team was originally brought together to find Destiny's premonition filled diaries, but of course, along the way, was distracted by many other imminent threats. As you do when you're on an X team. Number four, Generation Hope. This one is from the 2010 series Generation Hope and was under Cyclops' banner ultimately following the events of Regenesis. Though the team itself was led by mutant Messiah, Hope Summers, and its roster consisted of No Girl, Pixie, Primal, Sebastian Shaw, Transonic, Velocidad, and Zero at that time. Though originally Hope's team started pre Regenesis as just being five mutants, including Hope herself, with Velocidad. Dad, Oya, Primal, and Transonic on the team. The team was a search and rescue group who were brought together as they were acknowledged as being four of the five lights on Cerebra. Hope basically triggered the rebirth of the mutant gene, activating these mutants. The fifth light was what they sought and kind of why they came together, heading to Tokyo, Japan. Zero was the mutant they sought who would eventually join the team. Although originally would be antagonist. Number three, X People. You probably forgot about this team just because their name is, well, super forgettable. But they are actually from a very memorable alternate universe, the MC2, or also known as Alternate Earth 982. This Earth is the home of the beloved Mayday Parker, aka Spider Girl, now known as Spider Woman. But you know what's not so memorable from that universe? Their version of the X Men. I mean, I get that X People is meant to be gender neutral, more inclusive, but is that really the best name? they could come up with. There has to be something that isn't X-Men that is better than that. I mean, I know there is because we have dozens of other X teams with the letter X in them that are way more catchy than X people. Because of the Earth it is set in, X people is a team of originally younger mutants who are now older and taking on the role of leaders, mentors, and teachers. Actually, here Jubilee is the team leader, with their core team roster including Simeon, Angry Eagle, Torque, and Spanner. Number 2. Factor 3 Factor 3? That sounds like some kind of toothpaste. This is another villainous team composed of mutants but led by an alien known as Mutant Master. You might not remember it because it was only around for a few issues and also first appeared way early on in X-Men issue 28 back in 1967. This team popped up a few times and would often force mutants into doing their bidding, often mind controlling Banshee to attempt to kidnap or help kidnap Professor X. What a wacky time it was. Fortunately, in issue 39, Factor 3 was defeated for good and hasn't bothered the X-Men since. So we haven't seen them for a really long time. Number one, Lightning Force. This X-Men team comes to us admittedly from an alternate reality, which might be why you've never heard of it before. But once you learn about them, you'll likely wish they had remained forgotten. Lightning Force is an X-Men team that we come across in the Exiles who themselves belong to Earth 597. They are basically the alternate Excalibur team from their reality, a reality where the Axis won World War II. I think you know where we're going with this. Their roster is almost as surprising as the whole idea for this team. We have Hair Xavier, who helped to create the team through experimenting on them. Yikes. And leading the team, we have Hoptman England, aka Captain Britain, with Magon, aka Gloriana, Shadow Cat, and Nightcrawler. Also, if you were wondering, yes. Kitty Pride is still Jewish in this reality, which yeah, makes her character's history here pretty dark. Number 10, All Female X Men. Oddly enough, this book didn't do as hot as expected, despite the fact that it was an awesome powerhouse team composed of all ladies. This team was first introduced in 2013's X Men series in issue number one as one of the main X Men teams, and the series was part of the Marvel Now event. The team featured Kitty Pride, Rogue, Rachel Summers, Jubilee, and Psylocke, with Storm as the leader. This team was the first in the history of the X Men to be an all 
female team with its own book. So while it was not a commercial success, it's still an important part of X-Men history to be noted for sure. Number 9. Chuck Austin's Uncanny X-Men At least I kind of hope you've never heard of this one because if you have you probably just forgot about it after years of trying and now I'm traumatizing you by bringing it back up. This is the team that featured Stacey X. Yeah. I like Stacey X, but I can also see why her character and this run were super problematic. Austin's run on Uncanny X-Men began in issue 410 and ran till issue 443. The problem here wasn't so much to do with the members of the team as the subject matter. Many people feel that Austin's run was hypersexual and he also gave us the revelation that Nightcrawler's dad was Azazel, which honestly isn't that terrible, but then he also gave us the weird Draco storyline with the X-Men versus the Neofem, which was something. It was a time. All in, this was definitely a controversial run, especially considering the relationship between Husk and Angel. The team was made up of Archangel, Beast, Iceman, Nightcrawler, Stacy X, Wolverine, and Professor X himself to start, but it would later on feature Husk, Polaris, Northstar, Juggernaut, and Havoc. Before we move on to this next spot, just a quick little reminder to click that like button if you haven't already, it really does help us out. Number 8, Children of the Atom. You might not have heard of this one because it isn't even out yet, but this is one of the new teams and books that we had expected to see earlier this year, but due to the global pandemic was delayed and is now delayed again. Originally it was moved to January of 2021, but now we aren't expected to see it till April of 2021. Boy, that is a long wait. But just because they aren't around yet doesn't mean we can't talk about them. And if you haven't heard of this team yet, you might want to keep your eye out for when their book is released. Children of the Atom is a team of new teen mutants who are basically X-Men super fans and are trained by these very famous original mutants. Technically the X-Men team was never meant to exist in Krakoa, as was just revealed recently in the comics, despite them having their own book as part of the Dawn of X line. I know, it's a little confusing. So so it'll be interesting to see how the children of the Atom, who are being advertised as kind of X-Men sidekicks, fit in exactly in a world where, you know, there's not really supposed to be X-Men. Well, we have yet to meet the members of this team. We do know some of them not only have similar costumes to the classic X-Men, but also have similar powers. Number 7, Hellions. No, no, not that Hellions. This Hellions. In fact, Empath's look in the new Hellions was a throwback to the original Hellions team outfits. Empath was also an original member of the team. Before we saw the team revived in Dawn of X, they were Emma Frost's team. Basically her version of a teenage mutant team similar to, well, the new mutants. We're also a teenage mutant team. Every time I say teenage mutant team, I just want to say teenage mutant ninja turtles, but that's not what we're talking about. Although they are also a teenage mutant team. In comparison to the new Hellions, these Hellions were not as crazy, but were somewhat troublemakers who had an ongoing, sometimes friendly rivalry with the new mutants themselves. The team consisted of Empath, Beef, Bevatron, Cat's Eye, Roulette, Tarot, Thunderbird, Jetstream, and Firestart. The team was first introduced to New Mutants issue number 16 in the 1980s and was disbanded in 2009 in the comics after most of them were basically slaughtered, victims of a surprise attack. The team has returned since, but the new Hellions team only shares one member of the original roster, Empath. Number 6, X Corporation. Many people may have forgotten the existence of X Corporation since the organization was destroyed and became defunct back in the early 2000s, but they are coming back, so it's a pretty good time to remind everyone of their existence. Reminder, X Corp is still a thing. This actually just happened in the comics during the Empire event when we saw for certain that Xavier had revived the X Corp and that Monet and Angel seem to be running this branch of mutant affairs. X Corp in the past has been a non for profit organization working to help mutants in their fight for rights in less bold ways than what the X Men are usually up to. It also provided a place of refuge for mutants who needed it. And so the global organization had their various branches targeted and blown up around the globe following the events of M Day. X Corp will be getting their own book in the Dawn of X line, which I am way too excited about. I just want to see Angel get a moment in the spotlight, you know? Many believe the book to have been cancelled, but Jonathan Hickman actually confirmed early in December that it is still very much a go. Number 5, 
X Men The End. In this series, we saw a bunch of teams kind of come together, ending in one big one, and Chris Claremont's The End. I like this X Men team as well because although she died pretty early on in terms of her appearance here, we also get a shout out at least to Dust. And Dust is such an underrated X Men, in my opinion. This comic also introduces us to the future daughter of Bishop and Deathbird, Aaliyah Bishop. The final X Men team features Kitty Pride, Wolf Spain, Karma, North Star, Dust, Martha Johansson, aka No Girl, The Cuckoos, Cyclops, and a subgroup known as the Heavy Hitters, which features Wither, Frenzy, Polaris, Juggernaut, and Kid Colossus. Number four, the Upstarts. Speaking of young mutant teams that are lesser known, like the Hellions, we also have their straight up not friendly at all rivals, the Upstarts. The Upstarts were definitely a more villainous crew in comparison to the Hellions, just in general, as their whole goal was to basically kill mutants. The Upstarts were a mutant team created by Selene, the Black Queen of the Hellfire Club. She put the team together in order to test the members, getting them to compete for points, which would be awarded whenever they kill mutants, based on the mutants power set. Originally, the young group of mutants involved were unnamed and were promised that whoever got the most points would win a prize, which remained a mystery pretty much through all of the comics that they were featured in. I bet it's cake, and I bet it's a lie. Although I think it was also mentioned at one point somewhere that it was immortality, so in case you were wondering, for realsies. Number three, a Battle of the Atom, Future X-Men. While everyone might focus on the Battle of the Atom, Future Brotherhood team as Ray's has a tendency to steal the show, plus my girl Zorn Jean and also featuring Molly Hayes, people tend to forget about the awesomeness that was the Future X-Men team the real X-Men team. This team featured a much more skilled Iceman who now was known as Ice Wizard, Wiccan who had become Sorcerer Supreme, Chimera who is believed to be Storm's daughter that she had with Black Panther, Shogo, Jubilee's son known as Sentinel X, Colossus armed with magic soul sword, Kid Omega as Phoenix, and Jubilee as Wolverine. Number two, Extreme Sanctions Executive. The other XSE. This team also spiraled out of the team that we talked about previously on part one of this list, Extreme X-Men. XSE here stands for the Extreme Sanctions Executive. Similar to the original XSC that Bishop was a part of in the future, this team is also like a military police force meant to maintain and in some cases enforce peace is kept between mutants and humans. Storm was asked to create the team by the United Nations and eventually would increase its numbers by recruiting the rest of her X-Men, making this team another government sanctioned mutant team, like X-Factor was and still one of the first of those types of teams. Team members have included Bishop, Cannonball, Magma, Rachel Summers, Rachel Summers is on every team, I love it, Psylocke, Rogue, Sage, Wolverine, X-23, and Gambit. Number one, X-Animals. If you're an intense X-Men fan, you may be familiar with Mojo's X-Babies, but are you familiar with his other attempts at recreating or recasting Marvel's 616 X-Men after they were believed dead? One such team that attempted to step in was the X animals This was a team of, well, animals, who each took on the role of a different mutant member of the X-Men. We've got a skunk standing in for Rogue, a bulldog for Wolverine, a pig for Dazzler, a rabbit as Havoc, a cat for our Storm, which I kinda love, a bird, possibly a hawk as Longshot, an otter as Psylocke, and a gorilla as Colossus. Sadly, this team was not acceptable as a replacement in Mojo's opinion, and he got rid of them. But I'd love to see them return at some point, if that's possible. Number 10, Nanny. First on our list today is the partner of the Orphan Maker, Nanny, a low-level telepath that paired up with the Orphan Maker as the two thought that the parents of mutant children were just straight up evil and ill-equipped to properly raise and protect their young mutants from danger. She and Orphan Maker traveled the world searching for young mutants to take care of, killing their parents to sever any family connections, and using her minor telepathic powers to control her new charges. Dubbed the Lost Boys and Lost Girls, these mutant orphans acted as her quote-unquote new children. Her first major mission was at the state home of Foundlings in Omaha, a facility where Mr. Sin 
Sinister kept many mutant children for observation and experimentation, and she was able to liberate them after escaping the grasp of the X-Men. Fast forward a bit and we see Nanny and the Orphan Maker attack the X-Men in Australia in order to quote unquote save them, however this led them to being overpowered and forced to flee to see another day. During the events of M-Day just after Decimation, we see Nanny resurface once more only to be defeated by Wolverine himself. Give her story a read for yourself starting with her first appearance in 1988's X-Factor, number 30. Number 9, Tusk. Not a whole lot is known about the early life of this inhuman, and honestly not knowing how he turned out to be like this makes him just that little bit more terrifying. Tusk has the ability to grow in power and in size into this monstrous form, as well as the power to produce smaller versions of himself that can act independently thanks to a psychic link. Tusk served Apocalypse as one of the original recruits of the Riders of the Storm, which lasted for quite some time until Stripe overpowered Apocalypse and the Riders served under him. Fast forward just a tad and we see the Dark Riders return when a lot of the mutant population began dying thanks to the effects of the Terrigan Mist. They went on a bit of a killing spree, getting rid of any mutant healer, believing that their powers were a violation of the natural order. And the reasoning behind that was that mutants had had their chance at survival, and that delaying their extinction was not the way to go about it. This caught the attention of Magneto and his X-Men, and the team set out to take down the Riders, succeeding after Magneto overpowered them and finished them off for good with some good old explosives. Check out Tusk's story starting with 1991's X-Factor number 65. Number 8, Bulwark. Oswald Boglin was another X-Men villain that we don't know a whole lot about, especially when it comes to their backstory, but I mean, hey, that's not the worst thing. It lets us speculate, and I, for one, love that. Bulwark had the ability to expand his muscle mass to unknown proportions, increasing his strength, durability, and resistance. He also wore these red leather bands all across his face and body, and it's assumed that this was done as a means of self-restraint to gauge the safe limit of his powers, as they would start to get a little bit tighter the bigger that he got. He was recruited by Emplet to join their team and torment Generation X, and that's honestly exactly what they did. The Hellions were successful in capturing the young mutants, but M had telepathically called for help, and it was answered by X-Men Bishop. M then took out all her frustrations on Bulwark, punching him through the school's biosphere, and then flying right after him. As he was about to attack M back, his muscles started to wither away, and knowing that he was defeated, he fled so that he could fight another day. Like many villains, Bulwark did not get a happy ending, as he was eventually captured by the revamped Weapon X program, and was unfortunately killed. Give his story read starting with 1996's Generation X, number 12. Number 7, Spoor. Andrew Graves developed his unique mutation at a pretty young age. Now what was that mutation you ask? Well for starters he had a very animal like appearance, kind of like Bigfoot, but that's not all because his real ability was that he was able to control people's moods and actions through pheromones. Growing up with an abusive father who forced his mother to kill herself, Andrew grew up with an intense hatred for humans and began using his powers to make others turn on each other and kill each other. He eventually adopted the name Spoor and became a member of the Acolytes and as a member of the team countless civilians and innocent people lost their lives. For a time, he was a prisoner of Excalibur as Dr. Rory Campbell wanted to cure Spore, but during the treatment, Rory's latent hatred of mutants got the better of him, and Spore manipulated Rory into an aggressive attack on him, which gave him the opportunity to escape. Sadly, though, this escape wasn't permanent, as he eventually made his way back onto the island and was killed during a sentinel attack. It was revealed later that Spore's motives for killing were a lot darker and sadder than we originally thought, though. Spore just hated himself as much as other humans, and in his mind felt that killing humans was very wrong, and that he, therefore, deserved to be killed himself. Check them out for yourself starting with 1993's Uncanny X-Men, number 300. Number 6, Barrage. Another one of the original recruits of the Dark Riders of the Storm on this list today. If you're not familiar with Barrage, he had the ability to transform his forearms into organic weapons capable of collecting ambient energy, and then firing it into powerful explosive blasts. Barrage served as an agent of Apocalypse and seemed to follow him no matter what the task was given, as he was a part of the attack on x Factor ship and the attack on the Inhuman City on the moon. Alongside the other members of the Dark Riders, Barrage switched sides and served under Strife after he was able to best Apocalypse, and they defended Strife's moon base from the X-Men and mortally wounded the unfit Apocalypse in combat. After Strife's death, the Riders traveled the world challenging any and all mutants, killing Mesmero and even their own Synapse in the process as they were too weak to even be considered worthy of living. Barrage was one of the few members of the Riders who survived the massacre by Wolverine because he actually wasn't a part of the team at the time. Honestly, lucky him. Fast forward a bit and the Dark Riders, including Barrage, embarked on a journey to kill mutant healers after a Terrigan mist cloud was spread throughout the world, endangering mutant kind, believing that the event was was to be a test of strength so that only the strongest would survive. When they attacked the healer Shen Zorn, they were caught off guard by his display of ultimate power, which unfortunately cost Barrage his life. Check him out starting with 1991's X Factor, number 65. 
Number five, Whiteout. Now I'm really starting to sense a pattern here because extremely little is known about Whiteout and her past. A lot of it is just, you know, assuming and speculation. We do know what her power is though. Whiteout possesses the superhuman ability to project a flash of blinding white light from her body. This light renders her opponents blind for approximately one minute, and for some unknown reason, her power only affects victims that she chooses, and not everyone within the range, meaning it can be used very tactically. So like I said before, a lot of her past life is speculated, but it's assumed that she has resided in the Savage Land for some time and it was there that she was recruited by the mutant Zaladane to join her forces of the Savage Land mutants. In her only known mission for Zaladane, Whiteout and the other Savage Land mutants attacked the X-Men in Chile while they were looking for Polaris. The X-Men defeated the Savage Land mutates pretty easily in this battle and Whiteout presumably just fled. Check out more of her for yourself starting with her first appearance in 1989's Uncanny X-Men number 249. Number 4, Fever Pitch. Real name unknown, Fever Pitch was a very handsome young man until his mutant powers manifested and he accidentally destroyed his own face. Thanks to his mutant powers, his entire body is made of an organic flame that allows him to radiate intense heat, fly, and discharge and throw explosive plasma. As the years went by and his powers became stronger, he eventually burned through his entire body, leaving him nothing more but a fiery skeleton, which ultimately led him to becoming a member of the incarnation of Gene Nation, organized and led by the Dark Beast. Fever Pitch was seemingly killed on his first mission by Nate Gray after his energy was siphoned off, but he did later resurface in Berlin trying to capture Abyss so that he could sell him off to some researchers. Now skip ahead a little bit and we see Fever Pitch classified by the government as a national security threat as he was one of the few mutants to keep his powers after the decimation of the mutant population. He was one of the many mutants to have a tracking chip implanted in his head before a trip into Salem Center. When the chip's true nature was discovered, he had it removed by Mr. M, who he followed when he led an exodus from the Institute. Fever Pitch was later captured by the anti-mutant group the Safe League and was injected with a dose of the legacy virus, causing his powers to straight up overload, killing hundreds including himself. Check out his whole story starting with his first appearance all the way back in 1999's Generation X, number 50. Number 3, The Nasty Boys. Comprised of Mr. Sinister, Ruckus, Multiple Man, Slab, Gorgeous George, Hairbag, and Ramrod, the Nasty Boys were the strike force organized by Mr. Sinister to take down the X-Men. The Nasty Boys made their first appearance all together battling the X-Factor after Slab initially attacked Strong Guy. After losing this battle, Sinister posed as Steven Shafrin and unveiled his plan to kill the Scarlet Witch. Shafrin, obviously upset, attempted to kill him only to be killed himself. During all that, Ramrod was also deported from the country, but did make his way back, illegally. <laughs> Needless to say, this is a very busy group. The team was later regrouped by Sinister, and they hunted Malice, who was trying to kill Polaris, so that they couldn't re-merge, and they didn't stop this hunt until Malice was apparently destroyed by Polaris herself, and Havoc. A while later, the team decided to reform during the final days of Mutant Kind, after X-Man's return that ended in the death of most of the X-Men. Now, it was revealed to be a bait set up by the upstarts to lure out the remaining X-Men, which they were not aware of, and they were all promised killed by the upstarts. Check out these nasty, nasty boys for yourself, starting with 1992's X Factor, number 75. Number 2, Forearm. Michael McCain, aka Forearm, was one of the founding members of the Mutant Liberation Front, a team of disillusioned and rebellious mutant youth. Now, Michael is called Forearm for pretty obvious reasons, but I will explain his powers a bit for you anyways. He has four arms, hence, you know, the name. And thanks to this mutation, he also possesses superhuman strength, stamina, and durability. Now, one of their first missions under the leadership of Strife was to liberate the incarcerated New Mutants members Rusty and Skids, and the team broke them out of prison, and the pair joined the MLF out of just straight up confusion. Skip ahead a bit, and the MLF travels with Muir Island where they meant to steal the legacy virus data, but while they were there, they learned about the Xavier protocols and decided to steal them instead. The team was confronted by Excalibur though, and they were quickly teleported away empty handed. After a second attempt to steal the legacy virus, Forearm left the team as he felt betrayed by Moonstar, who revealed herself to be an undercover shield agent. He later resurfaced as a part of a fighting championship in Madripoor called Bloodsport, where superpowered opponents fought to the death. However, in an unfortunate turn of events, Forearm was killed during a fight with former Serpent Society member Anaconda, who just broke his. His neck. Oddly enough though, he was somehow able to recover from death and made an appearance as a member of the MLF once more not too long after. Give a story read starting with 1990's New Mutants number 86. And number one, Executioner. Now with a name like Executioner, you can probably guess what this guy is all about. Carl Denty was a field agent for the FBI whose partner Fred Duncan was a member of Charles Xavier's underground who would cache the technological equipment that the X-Men confiscated from alien races. After his partner's death, Carl inherited all of the equipment and decided that mutants had caused way too much damage in the world, so he donned a lot of the equipment and started calling himself the Executioner, beginning his quest to punish mutants who had not been legally convicted of their crimes. Starting off with killing the mutant tower, Denty quickly teleported 
away once the X-Men arrived on the scene to stop him, but he was smart and decided to teleport to the X-Mansion to kill the comatose Emma Frost. However, he wasn't smart enough because he was still stopped by Cyclops and Cable. Now, none of that deterred him though because he still continues his mission of punishing mutants. However, for a while he actually did some good as he teamed up with the Punisher in Washington DC to protect the pro-mutant activist Reverend James Conover from the Mutant Liberation Front. This act landed him the position of potential recruit for the initiative, however, who knows if he was ever actually on that team because that was one of the last times we saw him. Check out his story for yourself starting with 1993's Uncanny X-Men Annual, number 1993. Number 10, Spider's Man. Yeah, instead of Spider-Man, we have Spider's Man and it's exactly what you thought. He's a guy made of spiders, and it's an absolute nightmare. Now, of course, I have to kick this list off with him. He showed up in the comics for the first time with Spider-Geddon issue three. Okay, right off the bat, look at him on the cover. Honestly, I don't think I'd open this. He looks like he's being ripped apart and spiders are pouring out. It's kind of the grossest thing ever. And even typing this up, I was like, yeah, I'm gonna get this done with at 10. I don't wanna look at this anymore. So it's a super fun comic. We have a bunch of Peter Parkers crossing paths, interacting with each other, and it's a blast. So they're all sitting together, and then we start to meet the others, and in tiny letters, we see the introduction to Spider's Man. Yeah, he's constructed of thousands of tiny little spiders that believe they are also Peter Parker. Every time this guy shows up, I feel itchy. I feel like there's spiders like in my shirt. I can't even read what he's saying. I'm too busy like smacking my hat to make sure there's no bugs in it, you know? Like it's just, ugh. Every hair that touches my neck, I wanna freak out. His home world on Earth 11580, he got his powers originally during a tour of Horizon Labs, where he fell into a hive of radioactive spiders and was seemingly devoured, becoming this hive-minded monstrosity man spider. And that's about all I'll say about them because I'm probably gonna throw up if I say anything else. And before we continue on with our list of wild alternate Spider-Men, if you guys could go ahead and give this video a thumbs up, it would be great. It's really helpful for the channel. And if we get enough likes, I will eat this Jurassic Park poster. I'm just kidding. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Now back to the list. Number nine, Spider-Man 1602. Yes, okay, the Marvel 1602 series brought to us from the minds of Neil Gaiman introduced us to Peter Parquois, also referred to as the Spider. He was raised by his Scottish uncle Benjamin, of course. And then one year on his birthday, like Harry Potter, he got a visit from Sir Nicholas Fury because he wanted Peter to enter in his secret little service. So he was like his new assistant. It's amazing because he spends quite a bit of time with no powers at all in this book until like the end of the story where he gets bitten by a spider and then he gets the powers we're all familiar with. Then in 1602, New World issue four, we see him again, this time referred to as just the spider instead of Peter Parkwell. Number eight, Ashley Barton. Coming all the way from Earth 807-128, making her first debut in Wolverine Volume 3, Issue 67, she's from the Old Man Logan timeline where she's the daughter of Tanya. Tanya is Peter's youngest daughter at this point, years down the line, and she's also Hawkeye's third ex-wife at this point too. Apparently she's got a great sense of humor as well, says Hawkeye. Then a few pages later, we meet Ashley Parker. And Ultron is the only father she really had growing up. How messed up is that? Yeah, because Hawkeye left when she was only three years old. I mean, pretty sweet though to have your dad being Hawkeye and then having your grandfather being Peter Parker. So when she's being rescued by Hawkeye, she tells him 31 inches to the left of her voice and then bam, just like that, no more bad guy. In fact, Ashley takes care of quite a few bad guys in that issue. Number seven, Spider Girl. Anya Corazon. She made her debut in Amazing Fantasy Volume 2, Issue 1, when she saw her friend being bullied, so she decided to step in, all without powers, by the way, just being a decent human being, so already I'm a fan. So she backs up her friend, they fight a little bit, and then later on she sees what she suspects is a shooting star in the sky, and she heads towards its direction hoping that it's a good omen. Well, it turns out not to be a good omen, but rather it's the sisterhood of the Wasp, as they were attempting to kill a man but Anya jumped in front of the attack because she's a great person. So while she was bleeding to death, this man, Miguel, was the sorcerer of the spider society. So he transferred some of his powers into her in order to save her life. Now this caused her to get the spider shaped tattoo it just appeared and then enhanced strength and agility, but she also grows this blue exoskeleton, which is super cool. She also rocks the big goggles too, and then no sleeves and of course, fingerless gloves because she knows what's up. And she also has camouflage abilities as well. And the best part, she's super flexible, kind of like Mr. Fantastic. She just stretches her body out. Not too shabby at all. Number six, six-armed Spider-Man. 
This one's actually very similar to our usual Spider-Man, only a little different, in which ways you would guess. He's got six arms. Why you ask? Well, that's what happens when you ingest a chemical that's meant to neutralize your power. Sometimes these things don't go well, as seen in every comic book. So it doesn't go as planned. So he grows four extra arms, having six in total. Quick math for you. The only cure to save this Spider-Man is in Michael Morbius' blood. He first appears in What If Volume 2, Issue 42, in a book titled What If Spider-Man Had Kept His Six Arms. So the cure to getting rid of the arms was in Morbius' blood, but he gets eaten by a shark here, so that's a no-go. Then the lizard comes along to play, and Spider-Man, with his six arms, just kicks his ass. Instead of the old one-two, here's the new one through six, Spider-Man says, before handling the situation very quickly. And then throughout the pages, he just takes out everybody. I mean, the beast gets handled by his six hands, and then he sneaks past Cyclops, he evades Iceman and Angel, and finally he talks to Professor X about his new problem, and we get this panel, which is glorious. We have Peter yelling about how he's a cripple, yeah, okay, a cripple with superpowers and four extra superpowered arms. Okay, Pete, relax. Number five, Spider-Punk. This one is actually one of my favorite costumes to throw on when I web up bad guys in the Spider-Man PS4 game. I dig the mohawk a lot, it's pretty badass. So we got Hobbert Brown. He made his first debut in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, Issue 10. So in the Spider-Verse storyline, President Norman Osborn, you heard me, he dumped some toxic waste that ended up turning this homeless teenager into a rock star superhero. So he ended up killing Osborn by bashing him to death with a guitar. And that was enough to get him on the radar of Superior Spider-Man, of course, when he was then asked to join the army of Spider-Man. I guarantee you somebody in the crowd watched him beat Norman and was like, oh, hope you place time in your life next. Love that song. Number four, Spider Assassin. Introduced also in a What If, Spider-Man vs. Wolverine in 2008, Spider-Man is a serious dude in this world. So this version of Spidey becomes an assassin that works alongside Wolverine, which sounds like a pretty cool gig. However, he eventually becomes kind of jaded with no problem when it comes time to killing bad guys and just doing whatever it takes to get the job done. This Spider-Man has beaten the Black Widow with ease. He's reckless. He's a little rough around the edges with his powers as well a little less fun to see in action in a way. Like this version of Pete doesn't even make quips or crack jokes like the other Spider-Man we know and love. No, this version just means business. I mean, he literally has a gun like in his web shooters, which he enjoys using after he tries the webs out. Number three, Spider-Side. Making his debut in the New Warriors issue 61, he was created by Miles Warren, better known as the Jackal, during everybody's favorite clone saga. This guy wasn't around for too long, but he's pretty memorable, okay? So he too can stretch his limbs out and he can even turn into liquid, okay? He's wild. So he came out of one of Jackal's pods and then thought he was the real deal, although he was just engineered to kill the real Peter, the real Ben, the real Kane, and the real Mary Jane. So he turned into a monster. That was his thing. So Spider Side and the Jackal killed like 2,600 people in Springville, Pennsylvania by releasing an airborne version of the carrion virus. So he has these extra abilities as well that make him stand out. Like his molecular structure, he can control. He can shapeshift and control the density of his body tissue. So it's gonna be a lot to keep him down. He can turn into liquid and then transform his fists into objects to fight with. He can turn into liquid. Like that Cards Against Humanity card that says chainsaws for hands. He would read that and be like, hmm. Number two, Mayday Parker. One of my favorite what of stories, okay, here we go. So we have Peter Parker, this time from the MC2 universe. So after enduring a battle with the Green Goblin, Peter ends up losing his left leg. And this is the end of Spider-Man as we know it. It's super depressing, he has to walk around with a cane, but at the start of this issue, he reflects on how much he loves his newborn daughter, May, saying he wanted to spend every waking moment with her and MJ. But of course, being Spider-Man, he had other stuff to do. He had other responsibilities. He has quite a bit to deal with. Now, having one leg is the only thing that he's got to deal with, or rather, May Parker has to deal with. Because now, we get to see May Parker grow up and put on the suit herself and take over the job, and it's great. She is a total badass. It's stated that she's not as strong as her father, like physically, when it comes to strength, but what makes her a driving force is her advanced spider sense. So her father would get a feeling that a particular spot was dangerous to him, whereas May's spider sense could pinpoint the exact direction the danger's coming from, and then she could recognize the danger too. Like if it's the same person shooting at her, she'll know, even without seeing them in the first place. She can recognize the danger. That's crazy. She's the coolest. And number one, Cosmic Spider-Man. Making its first debut in The Amazing Spider-Man Volume 3, Issue 9, Cosmic Spider-Man is exactly what you would imagine. It's Peter Parker from Earth-13 after he's retained the powers of the Enigma Force. He's one of the most powerful beings in the universe at this point. 
and he died at the hands of Solus in issue 11 when the Inheritors attacked Earth-13 and Peter confronted him. He was the powerful cosmic god version of Peter, which is what the Inheritors munched on, so he drained the force from Peter. That's how he died. So yeah, his time was short and sweet, but when you have extra abilities on top of your Spider-Man abilities, like flight, matter manipulation, energy blasts, you kind of can't get better than that. So I had to throw him on this list.